Right, take number... Oh my god. Um, I'm just going to read directly off the script because trying to be funky with it at all is just leading to problems and trying to make my beautiful face appear a shade that isn't crimson red is also proving impossible. So we're just going to read from the script verbatim. We're just going to do this all in one hit because otherwise I'm going to lose my mind. So hello everyone. Um, I go by Majestic Falcon, or Poppy, and today I want to start actually using this channel for something. So, firstly, a disclaimer, this channel is probably going to be a mess. I'm going to be trying different vibes for different videos, some more serious, some more academic, some comedic, some performancy, etc, etc. So who knows what's going to be coming up on this channel. And with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get into the meat of the video. Now, I don't want to be too cliche here and say that we have to go back to ancient times to start talking about marketing, to start talking about the topic of this video. Uh, but unfortunately for my desire to avoid cliche, we have to touch on hedonism first, which has its roots in ancient India and in ancient Greece. I won't get into the history of hedonism in this video or the number of variants and branches of it, but what's important for us today is that it is a set of philosophies revolving around pleasure. And it's important to distinguish here between the word hedonism as it's colloquially used and hedonism as it's philosophically used. Casually, the word hedonism is often used in a derogatory manner, referring to prioritizing pleasure that's driven by the senses, that's short-term and unsustainable, and that's selfish. Philosophically, it can refer to a vast number of things, but generally it doesn't prescribe sensory pleasure as being above any other sort of pleasure, such as the intrinsic pleasure of feeling intellectually fulfilled, for instance, nor does it tend to idolize short-term unsustainable pleasure, instead seeking to maximize pleasure sustainably. And finally, some hedonic schools of thought do prescribe selfishly seeking your best interests, your maximum pleasure, but they're much less well regarded than those that call its adherence to attempt to maximize the well-being in the world. Right, so there's the crash course in hedonism. And now for the hedonic treadmill. And this will loop back around for marketing eventually, I promise. So, the hedonic treadmill is a phenomenon where most people experience pretty small amounts of change in their pleasure level due to life events. So even if you take an event as extreme as being widowed or winning the lottery, sure, there'll be a change in someone's pleasure level, an increase or a decrease temporarily, but there won't be much of a long-term effect on the pleasure level. You return to a baseline state very quickly, and the baseline varies significantly between individuals, and the baseline can be moved by extreme life events, by particular forms of therapy, etc., but the literature does tend to conflict on how much this baseline moves in response to different stimuli. I'll only go into one study here because it makes some important distinctions between different types of emotional well-being, life satisfaction. It distinguishes between positivity and a lack of negativity. Important things like that. And this study is by Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton, and it found that income in the sample that they surveyed from the United States found that income is associated with higher emotional well-being, right up until around about seventy-five thousand U.S. dollars per year, at which point it tapers off pretty significantly. And different regions, it costs different amounts to live. We started to observe the taper pretty early, what presumably referring to cheaper areas to live. I promised myself I was not going to go off script and not going to go too deep into the weeds of a study, didn't I? Let's go back to the script. Let's do that. Let's go back to the script. Okay. Uh, where was I? This is only the most professional content for this channel. So this study finds that emotional well-being, income helps. Right up until where, essentially where you're safe, you're comfortable, you're stable, you feel not in danger, essentially. And further increases to your income have negligible effects on your well-being. 
So if heightened income beyond a certain point doesn't correspond with heightened well-being, we should look at our consumption. Does our consumption follow a similar pattern? Because obviously, income is correlated with consumption pretty heavily. If you have the money to buy something, you are going to be able to consume it. You have the option available to you, as opposed to someone who doesn't have the money. And we can't draw any rigid statistical conclusions, any hard science here, but we should be able to draw a healthy skepticism towards our own consumption and its effect on our happiness. And this is heightened by the fact that goods are often marketed to us as though they're going to make us happy, but when you look at the hedonic treadmill, I mean, we should be very skeptical of marketing that makes such claims whether it does so explicitly or implicitly, and more on the kind of implicit, more insidious nature of marketing later. Before we continue, let's get our definition of marketing sorted out. And while we're at it, we'll go over one or two of the common rules or common principles involved in marketing. So marketing is defined by the American Marketing Association as the activity set of institutions and processes for creating communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. Put simply, it's all the ways we make, talk about, and deliver stuff that has value for broad society. Call me cynical, but I'm immediately skeptical of this definition, mostly because it's by the American Marketing Association. You know, they've got a bit of a vested interest in making marketing as appealing as possible. They've got as much of a I need to stop trying to go off the fucking script. It only leads to pain. It only leads to pain. It's kind of in the best interest of the American Marketing Association to market marketing, to make it look as palatable and as good as possible. So, what issues do I take with this? Well, there's three. The first one is that a fundamental building block of modern, western, capitalist society is that everyone should be acting in their own self-interest. And yet I'm to believe that marketing is concerned with the, quote, value that these offerings have for, quote, customers, clients, partners, and society at large. If it has value for us, it's going to be easier to sell to us, sure. But you're only interested in selling it to us. Let's call a private interest a private interest. Let's call a duck a duck. The second issue, I failed to understand the inclusion of the term creating offerings. This is just referring to the process of production, of manufacturing. Manufacturing is not marketing. These are different things. Am I missing something here? I feel like I have to be missing something here because this inclusion is just baffling. So we're just going to ignore that part. And my third issue offerings. I hate this word. I hate that this word is here. Oh my gosh. If you see a jump cut around here, I probably got pissed off and started talking for a few minutes. Uh, why do I take so much issue with the term offering? Well, it implies that the consumer is not being manipulated into accepting the offering. It'd be like calling the Trojan horse at Troy an offering. I mean, technically speaking, you offered it to us, but this was not something that was agreed upon by all parties, forthright and upfront. The consent that you are getting for my acceptance of this offering is manipulated at absolute best, coerced at absolute worst, and more on that later. But bearing all this in mind, bearing these issues in mind, what definition will I be using for marketing for this video? Okay, quote, Actions carried out with the intention of driving demand for a product. And the conclusions I draw from this video will be pertaining to this definition of marketing. If you want to talk about other forms of marketing, all well and good, that's not what I'm talking about in this video when I say marketing. So, now that we've got our definition out of the way, let's have a look at one of the common principles of marketing, the four P's. 
and the four P's refer to four different aspects that must be considered for a product in the process of marketing. You have to consider the product itself, the price of that product, the placement of that product, and the promotion of that product. And I found some literature that actually criticizes the promotion category as being overly broad, and people have conflicting views on what is included in it. Is it talking about raising awareness of your product through informative or communicative marketing? Is it talking about persuading people to buy your products with persuasive marketing? So let's, let's give both of these aspects a look in turn. Firstly, communicative or informative marketing. Driving demand by raising awareness that your product exists. It doesn't sound like an issue at all to begin with. I mean, you're just raising the amount of information in the market. It's an important component of Western markets. You know, you're minimizing the risk. That's excellent. And even not in Western markets, even in other forms of divvying up resources, information isn't a bad thing, right? Right, I agree with you. But we can't just look at information in the market like a monolith, as just information. We have to pay attention to which voices get heard. I mean, viewing information as a good thing without any further analysis would be just like walking into a market square and handing one of the stall owners a megaphone. It's like, all of a sudden, the number of decibels in the square has increased. Rejoice all! Information in the market has increased. Uh, technically, yes. From this corner of the market, now I can hear this obnoxious bastard with a megaphone all of a sudden. Yeah, it's hardly giving all of the other stall owners a fair shake, though. And before I get too carried away with the metaphor and make everything break down, let's tie it all back in. So, unfortunately, larger companies and corporations tend to have deeper pockets than their smaller counterparts, which leads to their marketing departments. Did I say those words right? I think I said it right. Either way, big company tends to result in big marketing department, which tends to result in big amount of information being thrown into the being thrown into the market. And this is a really really interesting issue that we run into a lot of times when we look at free market systems, which is that the free market gradually gravitates towards a few really big sellers. And arguments against this often say, oh, that's just because the bigger a provider gets, the more streamlined they can make their services. You know, they can make things more efficient and give customers a better experience and better service, which then means, hooray, the customer's getting better service. The free market's doing its job, guys. Everything's okay. Everything's fine. But even if the service being offered by one of these massive providers is inferior to that being provided by a smaller one, you're hearing about this inferior service a damn sight more than you're hearing about the little guy. So you end up with this bias towards a few massive producers, as I say. So that's my issues with informative marketing. Honestly, not too bad. Not too bad. Thought I would have more issues with informative marketing. I'm, there's going to be a jump cut soon for me to collect myself to talk about persuasive marketing. Oh god. Ah, persuasive marketing. I'm gonna have to moderate my tone here, you know, so that I don't sound too, too bitter, too resentful, too sour. <sighs> find my center, find my center. Buy a Headspace subscription to find my center. No, I, this is a video on marketing. Let's not. Okay. <laughs> if this YouTube thing takes off, I'm never going to be able to take a sponsorship in my life. My goodness. Anyway. Persuasive advertising seeks to persuade people who already know of a product that they should buy it. This gets in the way of an efficient economic outcome first. Um, it just makes people make irrational decisions and this market-based economics thing we've got going on hinges on people making rational decisions in their own self-interest 
And if you try and persuade them, you're kind of impairing that rationality a little bit. But how does persuasive advertising go about this? It doesn't have, like, neuralizers, you know, the little memory wipe thingies from Men in Black. I did have to, like, Google to double check what the names of the memory wipe thingies were, by the way. Um, it doesn't have those. That's a plus. But unfortunately, it finds many other ways to fuck things up. So let's look at two of those. So firstly, persuasive marketing ensures that the information that the consumer possesses is biased. By cherry-picking the information that it presents to the consumer and slanting the information possessed by the consumer to be more favorable towards the product, right? So that's the first issue. And then the second issue is that the way that this already biased information is presented is designed to impair someone's rational decision-making process. For instance, there's this principle in psychology called the anchoring effect, where essentially you see a price, let's say, for an item. You see this mug, and this mug costs $5. Well, your brain immediately anchors to $5. If you see that mug for anything less, you're going to think it's a really good deal, because $5 is just, you just assume that it's the default value for the mug. And if it's the default price for the mug, then anything less than that's great. Hooray. And there's no way that this is exploited by flash sales or specials and items getting priced at price points that the company doesn't ever intend to actually sell a product at. Hmm. I mean, just look at Black Friday, for instance, where companies are literally marking up the price of their product a month out from the sale so that then they can say, wow, look, you're saving, you're saving 60% on this item. Wow. When in reality, it's just been changed like to back to the price that it was before. It's like 20% off the market price, but wow, 60% off. Wow. Wow. What a good deal. What a good deal. Of course, this is the part where I go off script. I've gone off script in every part. I'm not going to lie to myself. I mean, other techniques that are implemented to inhibit the rational decision-making of the consumer, though, include randomly associating a product with happiness when there's literally no logical reason for that product to be associated with happiness. Like, ah, uh, yes, shampoo and conditioner. The source of all of what is good in the world. It's like... It's like the windows to the soul, man. It's fucking shampoo. It's toothpaste. The fact that my smile is whiter doesn't mean that I'm smiling more. It's not gonna make me happy. But it's marketed as though it will. And then we start to associate the product with happiness. And then we buy it. And then it doesn't make us happy for the reasons that I've already outlined earlier in the video. I could go on. I could go on. I could get much more emotional about this. I could get much more cold about this as well. I could emphasize the inefficiency in the market. Usually, producers are supposed to have control over the supply for something, and consumers are supposed to have control over the demand. But, oh, when producers are getting inside the heads of the consumers, all of a sudden the producers have a little bit of influence over the demand. Oh, they've got a bit too much power in the market. And all of a sudden, our, our precious market equilibrium with the supply line and the demand line crossing over. Oh, no, it's all breaking apart. We have inefficiency in the market. I don't really care about the efficiency of the market breaking down. What I care about is that this entire principle hinges on the producer's getting inside the heads of the consumers and manipulating their decisions for the best interests of the producers and here's the kicker against the best interests of the consumer i mean at absolute best it's extremely manipulative and if you look at cases of negative marketing where you associate the lack of a product with a negative outcome, like, if you don't buy this product, you're gonna be ugly, you're gonna have no friends, you're gonna be XYZ, you're gonna be sad. You're towing the line of coercion there and blackmail. You're using threats to try and get people to act the way that you want. That's not really a good look, and we kinda give it a free pass. 
because what because this is the way the world is in either case whether you believe we're crossing the line into coercion or whether you believe it's just staying as manipulation the consumer's autonomy and ability to freely make their own decisions is being infringed on and i mean technically yeah the consumer is still the one making the decision but look at propaganda the same argument could come up we still have an external party exerting undue influence over the actions and attitudes of an individual infringing on the ability for someone else to make their own decisions unmanipulated unmolested by these coercive manipulative external influ influences and speaking of propaganda another component of propaganda is that it is widespread it is ubiquitous it is inescapable and you can escape the marketing of Zara. You can escape the marketing of H&M. You can find reprieve from the marketing of Glassons. You cannot find reprieve from the marketing of the fast fashion industry on the whole. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, marketing has a vested interest in driving demand for its products, right? And there's two ways that, let's say, Zara could go about this. Zara could try and take customers away from H&M and take customers away from Glassons and other fast fashion places, right? Take the customers away. And then we have, then we have competition in the market between the different producers and between the different sellers. And woo, here's our, here's our precious competition. Here's our precious market equilibrium. Here's supply and demand working the way that, the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. But then there's another way. There's another way for Zara to induce demand for products, and that's to increase consumer participation in the fast fashion industry. And you know what's great? Is that Zara wants this, H&M wants this, Glassons wants this, Just Jeans wants this, Allensteins wants this. I don't know any places that aren't in New Zealand really, but you get what I mean. There's a vested common interest amongst these different companies to induce demand for their industry. Take, let's say, fast food for an example, right? When I see an ad for Pizza Hut, do I start craving Pizza Hut? I mean, kinda, but mostly I just start craving pizza. You know? Like, when I, when I see all these ads for H&M, am I starting to really want an H&M product? Not really. I just kinda want a new shirt. So there's this really interesting common interest that companies in the same industry have when they should be competitors. And I'm not saying that there's some conspiracy, you know, and these companies are working behind closed doors with each other, but the effective outcome, at least to the consumer, is pretty much identical to if they were colluding the entire time anyway. So there's literature that shows that different marketing schemes will increase demand and then it'll stay this way and marketing will end and it'll, it'll continue. You know, demand will stay increased for a little bit and then it'll drop off and return to this baseline steady state, right? Okay, so I'm only being manipulated into having demand higher than my self-interest every now and then it's only temporary hallelujah but not so because one week h&m has a concerted push for more advertising and that's my demand for h&m and the next week glassons has a flash sale and there's my demand for glassons and the next week there's a new loyalty program with this other fast fashion outlet you see what's happening? All of a sudden, my steady state, the demand I have for the fast fashion industry should be here. But it's being held here artificially, essentially permanently, because there's always something, right? There's always something. And so what are we left with? We're left with consumers having this heightened demand for everything within the industry.
and then everything in this other industry, and everything in this other industry that's against their own self-interest. And we have larger margins for the industry, and we have consumers making misguided purchases that don't help them. It's not one of the cases of a larger margin for the industry correlating with a better outcome for consumers. It's an example of the industry profiting off of the suffering of its consumers, off of its customer base. And it should be noted that this manipulation is carried out in many different ways by many different forms of marketing. Sometimes there's this constant bombardment, this artillery strike of flash sales and bright colors and loyalty programs, things that you, you know that they're designed to manipulate you. But they're just hammering it into you over and over again. You're seeing that same ad over and over again, breaking down the walls of your psyche gradually. Other times it's more insidious. Other times a person or a personalized version of a company just wants to befriend you and wants to be let in. For the ulterior motive of separating you from the fruits of your labor, of course. Sometimes it's about smashing the walls to your psyche to make way for invasion and colonization of your own mind, but other times they'll allow you to keep the reins, they'll allow you to make your own decisions, but get you to let someone in. Someone who's going to whisper in your ear ideas that aren't in your best interest. So, to conclude, marketing really needs some change. Our modern economies and their success is measured against the yardstick of just gross consumption, and our demand to consume more and more and more is manufactured by those who stand to gain from that consumption. But until the day that marketing is altered, until the day that another force steps in, you're going to have to hold down the fork by yourself. You're going to have to hold down your own mind by yourself. Whether the forces that seek to break their way into the city of your mind, whether they seek to do so by destroying the walls with blasts and mortar fire and just wearing you down with brute force, or whether they seek to infiltrate with honey with words. I have only one thing to say to you, and that is, beware those bearing gifts. Thank you, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.